This spoils the movie Vi and the original novella. This shows and discusses spooky images and real acts of violence. What do we owe our past? Not just what happened to us individually, but what has happened to us collectively. Not just the past as it happened, but the past how it is remembered. The promises of the past and our expectations for the future. The past we think we're beyond and the past that's left us behind. Should we honor the past by continuing its rituals in the light of a new day? Remember its myths even when we no longer believe them? Or maybe in living for the present, we let go of the past and perform its last rites for our sake. The traumas, the false promises, the lies. Maybe some of the past is only owed our scorn. Things to remember so they are never again. We are haunted by the past in our present in countless ways. Rules governing our lives established by people no longer with us. The expectations of dead futures. Loved ones lost in a glorious past. Considering that we have the dead among us, it seems only right to share in a ghost story or two. The Soviet Union's very first horror movie, Vi, is a delight. Based on the 1835 novella by Nikolai Gogol, Vi is the story of Koma Bru, a student at a monastery in Kiev with a devil-may-care attitude. He's traveling the countryside with friends, getting lost and wanting a warm place to spend the night. An old lady lets them stay at her cottage, but when she gets Koma alone, she forces herself on him. She's actually a witch, and she's looking to take him for a ride. Koma is able to gain control of the situation and beats the witch down with a branch. As she's dying, she transforms into a beautiful young woman. Koma runs all the way back to Kiev. There, he's called to the head of the monastery. Last night, the local Sotnik found his daughter severely beaten. Her dying wish that Koma brew prays at her deathbed for three nights. With a genre first, I expect some roughness where the filmmakers are still figuring out what works, but this movie is so polished. There's so much craft in the set design, costumes, special effects, and cinematography. The set work by Alexander Puchko, the Soviet Union's Walt Disney, is immaculate. It starts at a period-accurate depiction of historical Ukraine and the Cossack people, with a lot of region-specific fashion and architecture, before it descends into the surreal, gothic, and chaotic at the drop of a hat. The actors perform with the same energy. A character will say something profound or mournful one sentence, and in the next turn around with some of the stupidest stuff you've ever heard. They do a wonderful job going from sympathetic to cartoonish. It's less like the somber and dry films people seem to picture when they think of old films, and more like Evil Dead 2. In the mid-20th century, the United States had the Hays Code dictating what wasn't allowed in Hollywood movies. Don't use profanity, including taking the Lord's name in vain. Never ridicule clergy members. If there's a religious institution in an old Hollywood film, you can be sure that it'll represent the voice of reason. But this isn't Hollywood. Vi is running off a completely different playbook. It is still a morality tale, but with different standards from Hollywood, which makes the plot feel unpredictable. A few times in the film, I was thinking, they couldn't be touching on this in the 1960s, could they? And after I watched the film, I read the short story and thought, he couldn't have been touching on these themes back in the 1830s, could he? But yep, they did, and yep, he did, and it's all great. 
I didn't need the context of the movie to get a kick out of it. It's got a quality that feels untouched by time. I think that's intentional for both the novella and the movie. At the start of the book, Nikolai Gogol claims this is merely an adaptation of an older Ukrainian folktale, something the movie also states. Folklore scholars can't find any instance of this though. All signs point to this being made up. The framing gives a sense of distance like starting a fairy tale with a long time ago in a kingdom far, far away. With all this talent both in front of and behind the camera, why did it take over four decades for the Soviet Union to produce their own horror film? Heck, this wasn't even the first time the Vi novella was adapted for film in Moscow. That first goes to the Russian film director Gonkarov? I'm getting sidetracked. There's a simple reason. Joseph Stalin thought horror was a trash genre, an anti-communist tool to keep people from a true materialist understanding of the world. M materialist as in things that compose our reality, not like being a material girl. For example, a story like Charles Dickinson's A Christmas Carol can present real problems such as wealth inequality and the plight of the working class at the whims of the capitalist class, but when it comes to providing solutions, it loses its grounding in reality with fantastical concepts like ghosts, time travel, and kind-hearted rich people. But Joseph Stalin died in 1953, so his opinions on genre were immaterial by the 1960s. Well, immaterial like a spiritual force, not like being irrelevant. In the decades after Joseph Stalin's passing, his legacy still had a hold on the Soviet Union. Vi, more than just a genre first or a watchable film, is a case of people in the Soviet Union contending with that specter through culture. If you haven't seen it before, please feel free to pause this video and watch it now. It's fine, don't worry, we're heading into a break anyway. We'll be back after this short break. So, you're interested in all that cinema has to offer, and you've already climbed the one-inch barrier of subtitles into a world of great films. Are you ready to peer behind the Iron Curtain into a world of great old films? I'm talking about so many Soviet films. Timeless classics like... Are you R? Are you already thinking that automation could free workers, but you are afraid that a ruling class would use that to further dominate workers? Are you now? So Laris, that asks, what if the last 10 minutes of 2001 A Space Odyssey were a whole film? You don't have to study Soviet media, the history of the Soviet Union, or even know Russian to enjoy these fine films but I don't have access to the Criterion Collection Closet. <laughs> don't worry, these films won't break the bank. But I don't want to support the Russian war apparatus. You don't have to. You can watch all these films for free for one complex reason. The Soviet Union did not agree to an international copyright agreement with the United States until 1973, and films directly commissioned by the CCCP are public domain due to their status as state-created products. If that sounds ridiculous and arbitrary to you, that is because copyright law is. Be free today. And now, back to the show. It is hard to overstate the impact of Joseph Stalin's time and power, though after some drafts I have found that it is easy to overwrite. The CCCP went from being a primarily agrarian economy to a heavily industrialized nuclear power. They successfully defeated the Nazis, expanding control deep into the Eastern Bloc, costing one-third of their population. Large-scale propaganda ensured that every province of the Soviet Union knew Joseph Stalin's life story and to associate him to the nation marching forward to a worldwide communist future, making the man board Joseph Jujaleski, Jugashvili, 
Yugashvili into Joseph Stalin, a man of steel. This march came with missteps and many under the heel. Rapid industrialization came with severe losses. Agriculturally, Ukraine suffered a severe man-made famine, caused in part by a push for a new, ideologically pure approach to growing crops, Lysenkoism, which rejected things like genetics and evolution as myths of the bourgeois. Religious practices were also at odds with the party line, making religious material contraband and committing devotees to be re-educated. Stalin's social cultivation extended to political leadership, even having Leon Trotsky, the Red Army general, exiled and assassinated. This all made the time after Stalin's passing one of chaotic upheaval. With so many naysayers purged, the party was left with many of Stalin's yes-men with no Stalin. In the scuffle for leadership, Nikita Khrushchev won out as the new party leader with a clear goal reverse course on many of Stalin's policies. You cannot change a country in one night. De-Stalinization happens slowly. Khrushchev released many political and religious prisoners. In a report to the Soviet Union's Congress of the Communist Party in 1956 on the cult of personality and its consequences, Khrushchev denounced the purges that occurred under Stalin's leadership and argued that the cultural status that Stalin made for himself was itself anti-communist. In the years afterward, the Soviet Union recognized religious freedom, allowing communities to openly display religious symbols. State monuments and symbols tied to Joseph Stalin were taken down. Stalingrad was renamed Volgograd, references to Joseph Stalin removed from the national anthem, on October 31st, 1961, Joseph Stalin's body was exhumed from Lenin's mausoleum. The old framework of proving the rightness of communism through the state's capacity was replaced with a new framework. The state's capacity to enrich the lives of its citizens. Households having washing machines, families having personal vehicles, entertaining arts and cultures for the people, an attractive present that would draw workers of the world to a communist future. This new policy in which the Soviet citizens' needs and wants were being catered to as consumers depended on industry to meet those demands. It also depended on the individual being trusted not to overconsume, to ultimately be practically minded. The times called for works that weren't being held back by constraints of the past works that explored the danger of being controlled by a desire for consumption over reason. In short, it called forth Phi. How do you cross a cultural threshold that once meant the end of your career or even life? It doesn't hurt to be cautious. Looking again at the opening statement that this film is an adaptation of a short story, that this short story is a recollection of local folk tales. This also reads like a cautious disavowal by the filmmakers of any politically divisive messages that could be read into the story. See, this wasn't my idea. It was what someone else wrote, and that was just something that he himself heard. This is basically an anthropological exercise. Outside of that and some rewrites that removed more sexually explicit scenes, Vi's filmmakers were boldly crossing lines on the ground. We talked about Vi breaking the taboo of horror, but it doesn't stop there. Remember, this is a Soviet Union film produced in Moscow by Moss Films, but the cultural identity is uniquely Ukraine with the Ukrainian short story. These were the expendable people under Stalin's regimes, those who starved in the spirit of agrarian ideological purity. These are now the people at center stage. Vi also reflects on the religious freedoms of the time, featuring a Greek Orthodox seminary as a vital setting in the story. Depictions of Christ, the cross, the Bible, all of these were contraband not too long before the film was made. If people held on to them, they were hidden away. 
There's a moment in the film where a long-neglected church is opened up and it's found in disrepair. I think this scene is representative of this cultural moment when Soviet citizens were opening up their religious institutions. Coincidentally, the year after Vi was released, the Hays Code formally ended in Hollywood, which created a sort of resurgence of films that were irreverent to those same religious symbols. It was a green light for films like The Exorcist to have profanity, allusions to sexual acts, and attacks on clergy. This one may feel more like a reach, but hear me out. I think Vi is breaking the taboo of undermining Joseph Stalin's mythology. Let's compare Joseph Stalin's pre-revolutionary life to the main character. They both did not have a relationship with their father. They both got educated at a Greek Orthodox seminary, but not to be a religious leader. They both were known for doing some jovial menacing in and outside of the seminary. They both made a lot of enemies as a result. This is not the origin story of the people's hero, where the plucky young rapscallion senses the seminary and the systems are not worth his adoration or time. This is the story of a young man whose poor treatment of others puts him in conflict with a witch, the church, the landed gentry, and his fellow countrymen. At any point, if Coma had shown a bit of solidarity with any of these people, he could have had a better outcome. But he disregarded them all out of a self-centered pride, greed, and defiance. If Joseph Stalin disapproved of the utility of horror as a genre, he hated works that challenged his position. The beginning of the end for Leon Trotsky may be his biography of Joseph Stalin, one that was critical of Stalin's roles within the party and his ideals. Shortly after penning this, Trotsky disappeared and was erased from the Soviet Union's official media. Critical depictions of figures similar to Joseph Stalin were not safe either. A series of films covering the life of the Russian Tsar Ivan the Terrible were commissioned by Joseph Stalin and was produced from 1944 to 1946, directed by Sergei Eisenstein one of the most influential Soviet directors of all time. Part one of the biopic came out in 1944, but Eisenstein didn't live to see part two premiere. Even though Ivan the Terrible was a Russian Tsar, Joseph Stalin saw aspects of himself in that Tsar, and as such forbade part two from being shown, an order that was followed until Stalin's death. If Coma is a parallel to Stalin, the film seems to say that people like him are not prepared for the responsibility of consumption. While there is a witch out to get him, it's Coma's desires that damn him. His want for a comfortable place to sleep at night puts him into the predicament at the witch's cottage. His proclamations to the witch, the head of the monastery, and the Sotnik that he won't take her food, he doesn't know the witch, he certainly never met the witch, or God strike me down, are almost prophetic for how bad things turn out for him. There's an easily overlooked point in the film where Coma could have turned his life around. He could have simply said prayers for the witch after she died, as he was requested. But all his prayers are for himself, and all to further damn the witch. I like to think that if he was forgiving the trespasses, he in turn would have been forgiven for his. But that's not how the story goes. Having a cultural and temporal distance from the movie and its implications may take some of the bite from Vi. Joseph Stalin is dead, the Soviet Union is gone, the success of destalinization is up for debate. What does it matter? Well, ghost stories, themselves haunted by greater cultural forces, can be closer to home than we'd like to think, because we ourselves are haunted. Hauntology is a type of media and cultural analysis that looks at elements from the past that persist beyond in society, in culture, and our imagination like ghosts. That may sound unserious, but it's actually a useful framework, 
After all, the zeitgeist is just a way of talking about today's ideas as if they were a cultural spirit. Why not talk about the ideas of the past the same way? We find those zeitgeists hanging around long since their time has passed. Watching older media can give a sense of nostalgia, whether it's nostalgia for when it came out or the first viewing experience. They don't make them like they used to. I wish I could forget this film so I can watch it again for the first time. I feel that way about the Godzilla films I watched on VHS growing up, lent from a family friend with a good connection to the foreign films market. Nostalgia may be associated with things you like, but it isn't a happy thing. It's more like gilded melancholia. Nostalgia is from the Greek words nostos, meaning homecoming, and algos, despair. It was first used to describe the feelings of longing that Swiss mercenaries had for their homeland while stuck in a war zone. But nostalgia for the past is a longing for a home you cannot go back to. Vi, as a film set in the nebulous Once Upon a Time period, taps into the rustic nostalgic look that is doing the rounds on the internet. TikToks of people emulating traditional simple lives, Tumblr accounts dedicated to well-manicured cottages. Vi complicates its idyllic countrysides, though. For every picturesque field, there's a pile of mud for Coma to trounce through, and there's no happily ever after. Also, side note, the historically appropriate way the farm animals are handled on set doesn't seem fun for anyone involved. Something to consider next time someone tries to sell you on the good old days. The times don't have to be good to have an effect on you. Traumatic experiences haunt people, individually and collectively. The original Godzilla film was born from the shock of the nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Godzilla's look evokes the scars of Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors. The Godzilla movies as a whole hang like a shadow of the nuclear bomb over Japan and represent the uncomfortable compromises Japan had to make with their real-world nuclear giant. The tone changes across the different eras, but what hasn't changed is how Godzilla is the harbinger of Japan's modern cityscapes constantly being destroyed, sort of questioning if it'll ever be safe to rebuild. That traumatic unease is all over Vi. So much of the plot is about Koma dealing with the shock of his encounters with the witch, the Sotnik dealing with the shock of losing his daughter. Just considering the sets, though, it's clear that the church and the religious iconography is more oppressive than a representation of sanctuary. Koma being alone in the church among the cold stairs of Jesus has him terrified long before the witch begins to reanimate. Is it really safe to be here? Sometimes the idea that haunts us the most is that things could have turned out better, if only. Modern shooters are so haunted by the lies we've been told about modern wars. Call of Duty 4 has a US invasion of a Middle Eastern country going wrong mimicking the look of how the second Gulf War was broadcast. During the release, the game was hailed as having a sense of realism and grounding, that is, like sections could have come straight from headlines. A lot of games in turn followed COD 4's success, but how accurate is it really? With COD 4, this scenario is justified in ways that the Iraq War never was. Here there are secret weapons of mass destruction, and we do get the bad guys that orchestrated the war. Or Battlefield 3, which had its own US invasion of a Middle Eastern country. This time there are secret weapons of mass destruction, and we do get the bad guys. We play out what happened again and again, wishing the outcome was different. Leftists coined the term hauntology to describe their experiences in the 1990s. The Soviet Union had just fallen, and neoliberal political thinkers asserted that, with no near peer to the United States, we'd reached the end of history. 
just capitalism as we know it from here on out forever. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was an equivalent collapse of political imagination. The left was haunted with the dead future of the USSR and had to contend with what was to be done. Where do we go from here? Where can we go? If you still don't know what I mean by a dead future, then let me just explain how Bernie can still win. Joseph Stalin thought fantastical ghost stories had no utility for the working person, but I think Stalin was wrong. Ghost stories are ways to acknowledge and engage with these relationships that hold sway over our lives. We can find ourselves in others possessed by ideas long gone. Memories can haunt us. It can feel like we are judged by the departed. Unlike Vi, the king of the gnomes, we can look back. In stories, we can play out the worst fears or greatest fantasies. If characters triumph in the face of the only imaginable, we can picture our own triumphs too. Even when they fail, we still get a sense of catharsis, seeing a recognition of the inherent humanity of someone who falls short. In looking back, we can challenge some of the beliefs that are supposed to be unquestionable, untouchable. We can take away their magic. We can exercise their spirit. Please check out the description for links to some of my sources, as well as sources that I took major inspiration from. I have to especially shout out Alexander Herbert's Fear Before the Fall. It's a great book that catalogs the social and political history of the Soviet Union through the lens of their horror media, starting with Vi and going beyond. The insight that Vi's introductory footnote may have been a sort of cautious out for the creators, that I got from Mr. Herbert's book. But there wasn't an elegant way of stating that in the video proper, because no matter how I put it, it always seemed like I was making my own cautious out. Lastly, I plan on releasing one more video this year. I don't want to say much about it, because I don't want to jinx it, but I'm excited. 